I started the Black Star Project because when I was growing up, there wasn't a Black Star Project or anything like it. There wasn't an agency that advocated for me as a young black man. There wasn't a place where I felt safe, where, where I felt honored, where I felt that I could be a young black man. So I started the Black Star Project. Not only do we work with young black men, we work with young girls, we work with Latinos, we work with Asians, we work with everybody. Anyone who walks through those doors, if they're interested in education, if they're interested in improving themselves, if they're interested in helping themselves and the rest of the people in the world, then they belong to Black Star. All right, guys, so way back on my old channel, okay, one of the, like, very first videos that I made was kind of about, like, my experiences in some of the schools and, uh, you know, some of the problems that we face with some of the youth, okay, and, you know, the temptations of the streets and some of the problems these kids were facing in their lives that were causing them to kind of turn off the path towards, you know, financial and academic success. And, you know, one of the biggest things that I had brought up, okay, when we were discussing solutions, you know, this was a time when I only had like 100, 200 subscribers, something like that. We were kind of discussing solutions for this. And, you know, the thing that I suggested at the time was mentors for a lot of these kids, because I felt like what was uh, missing in a lot of their lives was just mostly somebody to just keep an eye on them and make sure that they get good advice. Because I noticed that a lot of the kids who were, you know, having problems in the streets were even getting bad advice. Like, I was like, these kids need somebody in their lives who's done it, you know, who's made it through school, who's get to the point where they can support themselves legally at a level where, you know, they could support a family. Not necessarily rich, but, you know, to where they could support a, a, a family. A lot of the girls, actually, that I was, you know, meeting in Chicago Public Schools, they were doing it. You know, actually, like, a lot of the girls were actually getting it done. Most of the dropouts, you know, and most of the guys who were failing were like the guys, you know. So I was saying, you know, we just need somebody, some guys in their lives who are what like these kids can aspire to be. And one person who actually like was making that idea a reality from like even before, way before my channel or way before any of this was a guy who I consider to be like a Chicago legend, man, because, you know, he was, he's one of like the unsung heroes of the city. A lot of times the athletes, you know, the the music stars and in Chicago, even, you know, street legends like gang members, they get a lot of recognition and fame. But I think, I feel like it's people like this that really should get, get more fame. Philip Jackson, okay, he was executive director of something called the Black Star Project. And what that was, was it was basically like a program that provided mentors to youth in the city of Chicago. I mean, he was focused on uh, particularly black youth, but there's other programs like this that focus on, on other kinds of youth. But I mean, I'm just bringing uh, him up at this point because he actually just passed. Okay. And, um, you know, I didn't know this guy personally. He's a guy that I would have liked to have interviewed at some point because he was actually doing, you know, the exact same thing that... Uh, a lot of people, not just me, but a lot of people thought would be the best idea. And one person who did know him, though, uh, was one of the uh, staff writers over at the Chicago Sun-Times, Mary Mitchell. She's been on Chicago tonight a bunch of times. She used to live in Cabrini Green. Um, and what she said, her words about uh, Philip Jackson, she said, no matter how hopeless our situation looked, she said, Philip Jackson, the founder of the Black Star Project, believed in black people she said um she said while the rest of us lamented the absence of black fathers jackson got busy building an organization that helped black fathers embrace the responsibilities critical to the development of black children he loved black people enough to hold them accountable while helping them overcome the obstacles in their way and it's incredible like some of the obstacles this guy faced okay i'm gonna get into that in a little bit um he was a community organizer he was a uh, i think he was a teacher he was involved in education in some way and he used to be the head of the CHA, the Chicago Housing Authority. He was a, a Chicago Public Schools administrator also. He actually just died last Sunday, okay, and he was 68 years old. One of the one of the obstacles that he faced though, you know, being being involved in city government and being like connected to the mayor of Chicago, um, you know, a lot of people in his own community didn't trust him. You know, in the black community, there's a deep distrust of government and even of black guys who are in the government. So this guy being in the government, you know, and having a, a position where he was basically 
uh, on the same team with a bunch of like you know white politicians. A lot, he, a lot of people called him an Uncle Tom. They called him all types of like nasty terms. And Mary Mitchell said about him that uh, when they first met, he was a budget administrator at City Hall. And uh, his Black Star Project, which again is a mentoring program, was just taking shape at that time. She said um, he was so like passionate about creating positive change. Was mis that according to Mary Mitchell, she said that some of like his exuberance was misunderstood. She said, for example, while he was CEO of the CHA, Chicago Housing Authority, she said a lot of people in the black community accused him of being a puppet for the mayor, which is what I was just saying. She said some activists and politicians even labeled him as an Uncle Tom and accused him of being involved in a land grab by private developers. So as you guys know, you know, when the projects were torn down, okay, that was a very controversial issue. It had a lot of racial connotations to it, okay? And she said a less confident person would have withered under the pressure. But according to Mary Mitchell, Jackson had a vision of what the black community could become. And he said, the schools alone cannot do this. It's going to take the community to help our kids. At one speech that she attended, he asked everybody listening to join him. But if you did not want to join him, join with others to help our children, she said, according to, according to him, that's what he said. Okay, then in October of 2014, something called the Adjoin Fund was incorporated to help public school African-American middle school boys become more competent readers. And uh, she said, today we are about 225 strong. Many are simply people who understand the plight and contribute to the cause. And Philip Jackson will, be, will not be remembered as one of the preeminent movers and shakers in Chicago, but trust his legacy his concern for our children will move on, according to her. And she felt like, you know, his love for uh, what he was doing and, you know, for the people he was helping really shown, showed through. So rest in peace to Philip Jackson, man. You know, I just wanted to give a shout out to him because uh, hopefully somebody will carry on his work because even if it, a lot of people are going to say, look at all the problems Chicago's got, you know, it's not making a difference. Like we got all these murders and stuff like that. But the thing is, it made a difference to somebody. You know what I'm saying? Like, even if it's just one, two people, and it was more than one, two people, but I'm, I'm saying, like, even if it's only a few people, it made a difference to them. Ultimately, you know, we experience this life as individuals. Numbers, in the end, don't matter to the individual, like, who, who's impacted by something. Our own individual experience, ultimately, is, uh, is as great in scope as, as the collective experience. I think this guy, man, he definitely deserves, like, something, some street, you know, something in honor of him. Hopefully, you know, they'll have some monuments so that people can at least remember. And hopefully uh, somebody else can read about him and, and uh, be inspired to do the same thing. Because I'm telling you, man, if, if there was more organizations like his, I think you'd see Chicago be a lot more peaceful place, honestly, man. So anyways, guys, uh, be smooth out there. This is your boy, Chicago World News. I'm out. Uh, when it comes to the Chicago Public Schools... We want to help them do better. We want to help them educate the masses of their children, all of their children. But once again, they don't, they don't, they don't reach out to us. And when we reach to them, uh, we generally don't get great results, especially for African-American fathers. There has to be a rallying point. There has to be a, a catalyst. And there has to be a, a place, if you will, where black fathers can go and can find relief, comfort, and support. And so I read an article recently uh, about uh, the curse of black fathers. And it's really the curse of black men. It's how we compete against each other. It's how we work against each other. It's how we hurt each other. And we don't even know why. And so it, it, it has become a curse that uh, grandfather passes down to his son and father passes down to his son. And unfortunately, unless we break this curse, our young men of today will pass down to their sons. So uh, there has to be a truth teller. There has to be someone who's unafraid to tell the truth, even though it, it's never popular. And that's what I think about Father's Time. We look at several streams of funding, government funding, corporate funding, foundation funding, fee-for-service uh, funding, as well as membership funding. And what we have found is by having that kind of a balance, we can protect ourselves against uh, the whims of government or against uh, the ups and downs of the economy. 
And I would suggest that any not-for-profit uh, that's serious about staying around, Black Star's been around for 17 years now, that any uh, not-for-profit that wants to have longevity, you cannot depend on one or two sources of funding. Ability is based in, in the balance of two concepts. Number one, being true to your original mission. But number two, being flexible, being adaptable, and being nimble. Being able to change on a dime. Now, what that means is, you have your original mission, but you shouldn't fall on your sword. You shouldn't live and die with that mission only. Uh, the world changes. And so what we started out with as a mission at the Black Star Project, which was to eliminate the racial academic achievement gap, it has expanded now. And it's expanded to provide you know, excellent educational services to communities to families, uh, as well as to individuals. And so we're still working to eliminate the racial academic achievement gap. And so our core mission is still embedded in what we're doing now. But uh, it was very important that we expand how we uh, sought to implement that mission and, and bring, uh, bring those uh, 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 ideas into execution. That has expanded, and it has made us uh, larger, uh, more powerful, and more recognized. So I would ask people to do those two things. Have your original vision, but be flexible in your thinking, be, be supple, be nimble, and be ready, ready to go, ready to grow.